Hey folks, my name is Suds. And I'm Nikki. Welcome to Zero Calorie Marketing. Tune in to listen to us speaking to some of the most innovative, brilliant, open-minded marketers we know. Each episode features a different marketeer with a unique perspective on marketing, branding, life philosophy and everything in between. Lend us your eyes and ears for the next hour or so as we discover more about the person and also the unique path that they took which led them to where they got to. And the real story behind the why, where, when and how they do what they do. Without a further ado, let's get to it. Welcome to season two, episode three of uh, Zero Calorie Marketing. I am the host, Suds, co-host and also founder of Interesting Content, joined by Nikki, uh, the lovely co-host from Leafy Hertfordshire. Uh, <laughs> it's Leafy. So Tom, this Leafy Hertfordshire thing is just uh, this image Suds has tried to create of me where I, um, everyone thinks I'm, you know, around horses and sheep and just frolicking very much like great, great expectations, maybe. Um, but no, that's a big lie. <laughs> I'm stuck in four walls like everyone else. Um, I just have more miles to walk, probably, when I do. Oh, on. come on. You know, you're you're amongst green. Whereas I'm looking outside the window. I'm looking at a car park here. You know, I mean, I'm in central <laughs> London. Uh, so I have a intro for our very illustrious guest, Tom Hunt. I don't know if you remember, Tom. We actually met all the way back in 2014. Yeah, I do. I code, code email do, I think. Yeah, you did. And you know what, Tom? I actually found your email very, it was well written. And I was like, oh, oh why, don't, you. why don't we speak? And then that was back in 2014, uh, when you were still working for a big management consulting company back then, I guess, and still doing your side hustles and, you know, doing things on the side. And that's how we actually met. Around that time, I just finished working for a corporate company myself. And I was doing, I was working as a consultant. The genesis of interesting, for interesting content, I should say, my current company was just an idea at that time. And it was something I was working on and building. Although we didn't end up working at that time, I had kind of stalked, I guess, or followed you on different social channels and seen what you've been up to, you know, really kept an eye on things that you've done. To say you've been a busy bee is a complete understatement. Not only has Tom traveled the world and lived every entrepreneur's dream, has built, sold and exited series of businesses, done a TED Talk, appeared on BBC's Dragon's Den and really lived the life most entrepreneurs, including myself, would very much envy. His speciality is building and growing B2B businesses. He has a degree in chemistry from Imperial College London, after which he went on to work as a management consultant in the City of London. Fast forward to 2020, he is a host of his own podcast for marketers, called Bcast, and also the founder of Fame, which is a service which starts and grows the world's most profitable podcast for B2B businesses. Today, he's here to talk about the difference between knowing the path and walking the path. Welcome to the show, Tom Hunt. Thank you very, very much for the beautiful Thank you. introduction. Very accurate. Everything is perfectly accurate in that. But I, and we can get into the details uh, on the show. <laughs> We actually, it's just before this, you know, when I was writing up your bio, I actually looked at your, I was watching your TED talk uh, yeah, from yeah. back in 2014. And you know, what? a lot of the stuff that you've said is still relevant. And the themes that you discuss is very much pertinent for a lot of businesses and entrepreneurs and founders. How do you see that TED talk yourself, you know, looking at it now? Or have you, when was the last time you watched it? Yeah, no, I, I don't think I've ever watched it back once. Um, I think, yeah, like the themes are relevant because they were taken from like every self-help book you've ever read. Mm. I, it, it, that, that was the point in my kind of journey where I think at the start when you're like getting into business and self-help, you get really like excited about stuff and, and you think it can, everyone should know about it and, and it will change the world. And so that's kind of what happened. And so that talk, it, it's really, uh, uh, I, I can't remember the exact sources, but it's like a summary of like, classics help stuff right which is essentially that you if you're trying to achieve something have a bias for action so you learn along the way and so that yeah it, it, i think it's always going to be relevant and it has it, it's almost been it like i've stuck to that too much i think in that mm. i have my bias to action is too biased in that mm. actually that i should be more strategic about what i do and do less stuff and mm. so that's actually what i'm trying to do now which is like uh, and I only realized this five years after doing that talk, where mm. actually, yes, you do need to act and you do need to do stuff, but you need to be doing the stuff on the right thing for you. 
then mm -hmm. you need to do that for a number of years if you are going to build something successful. So that's mm -hmm. what I've been trying to do over the past. Well, I, I, I think I landed on that only a year ago. And so now my challenge is how do I do this, this thing for three to five years so I can actually build something significant? Because yes, in the intro, I did loads of stuff, mm -hmm. but only like if you go back through that, I probably only did the same thing or the max amount of time I did the same thing for was 18 months. And it's very hard mm. to build something significant in 18 months. And because mm. I was always like, no, I need to do something different. I need to be acting more. Yeah, like the themes are very relevant, uh, but they're mm. also quite telling. Well, my journey is almost a cautionary tale for if mm. you do that thing too much. I want to explore other things in, in a second, but just going back to what you said, would it be fair to say you had, I guess, this kind of propensity to start something, but not necessarily see it through right to the end, just because you had certain metrics that you wanted to make sure that you hit and if you didn't, or even if you were very close, you'd sort of drop it and then move on to the next thing. Yeah, it's probably, yeah, like an obsession with goals. Hmm. And then if the thing wasn't like up to the, the high standard you'd set the previous year, then you'd hmm. be like, okay, it must be the thing that's wrong. I need to change and do another thing and I can achieve this goal faster. I think really what happened was was that there was a, and you could blame, maybe you could blame it on the media. That would be my excuse. In that you, you, you'll only read about entrepreneurial success or well, you're more likely to read about an entrepreneurial success that happens overnight, like Instagram, starting and selling for a billion after 18 months. And so I was like, well, if my bootstrapped online marketplace isn't worth a billion or even a million after 18 months, then it must mm. be something wrong with the thing. Whereas mm. actually in reality, you just need to do, most of the time you need to do stuff for five years. Could you tell us about the first day after the infamous, infamous Dragon's Day episode aired? What was the first reaction that you got from people that you knew, your family, friends, and as well as in work colleagues as well? Yeah, so I was at work at Accenture. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason we went on it was was for like our, for our egos. So mm. everything that happened the day after was, or like as it aired, was just great for our egos. Um, people just thought it was funny. People still think it was funny, and it was really funny. We didn't really know what we were doing. Like we had no. We were like planning the numbers in the hotel the night before. And our models were like three other guys from our hometown. So it was just like a, lo a load of fun. And we were never going to get any money. We They don't guarantee you're going to be on TV either. So you can do all mm. this stuff and not actually get put on TV. But fortunately, we were like ridiculous enough to get on TV. So just to give our listeners and viewers a bit of a background, Tom appeared on the BBC's Dragon's Den, where he pitched a very, very bright and colorful men's leggings. The thing is, I think when we met, that episode hadn't aired. And I had, I think it was a couple of months afterwards that it actually did appear on TV. And I was like, I know that guy. I was having coffee with him a few weeks ago. I think it blew up on Twitter because it really got people's attention because it was three guys wearing very, very colorful and very eye-catching leggings. I think some of the dragons took you seriously and some of them actually just said, oh, is this a joke? Or <laughs> yeah, you know, are you yeah, having I a laugh I don't think anyone actually took it seriously. The best quote was Duncan Bantine where he was like, you do realize this is going to be on YouTube in 20 years and your children are going to watch it. That was like the, the most the cutting the most cutting takedown people mm. if, if you google meggings dragon's den you can find the video and watch it but no it, it was a great experience and yeah we there was a lot of exposure afterwards we got some mm. there was an article on Met, the mail online that got shared sixty six thousand times that had a backlink straight to our wow. homepage. Yeah. so it was great like the, the, we were reaping the seo benefits for years to come there was obviously a big spike in sales and it, it, it was a great experience looking back at that would you do you regret any of it would you go back and do something differently i don't regret it at all i think so i was pushing we started this in like 2013 on the side me and my two best friends i was living with and so i was like campaigning for my other two friends to like build this spend more time and then we can leave our jobs that had never actually happened in the end it, would it have been a regret i like I, I don't know if that's a business that we should or mm. should have invested all of our time into so maybe it's a good thing that we didn't so no i don't regret anything about that experience so it's just it's become a part of your journey to uh which has eventually led you to what you're doing now eventually yeah like a long and winding road we actually had the business up until so i bought it like it, it, i think we sold six thousand pairs of leggings in their lifetime but that was from 2013 wow. to 2018 or 19 so it was quite a while so i actually bought them out of the company in 2018 and then sold it six months later but not for a, like a life-changing amount because obviously we weren't making that much money. But yeah, that, that it, was, it was a great experience. Looking through your LinkedIn, you've started multiple, multiple businesses as well as exited some, as well as sold some and just uh, straight up shut down a few of these. What's been your biggest learnings from setting up companies and closing it down or selling it or exiting? Yeah, I think the first one is, as we've already discussed, if it isn't like blowing up in one to two years, hmm. that doesn't mean that it's not going to work or even a good thing to be working on. 
Mm. So that's the first one. Actually, the one business that I, I think that if I just persevered mm. so the whole time was actually the second iteration of the business I cold emailed you about. Mm. When I cold emailed you, we had this team in the Philippines and we were, it was like an outsourcing company. Yeah. Where we were charged for the, for the VAs and then we would manage the process. Then that morphed into this online marketplace where we would, it's essentially the same thing, but instead of us charging more and managing the whole process, it was a marketplace where you go and find them, hire them and pay them through the platform for like Upwork, but just for Filipino virtual assistants. So that mm. was the thing that I think is with arguably my biggest success. Not that it was a massive success because I sold out too early. I sold mm. out after 14 months of mm. doing that. And so the biggest learning, and I, I think that so that was sold in end of 2016 or 17. I think if I just continually executed on that for the next three to four years, it mm. could have probably been a significant business. So, mm. so that's my biggest learning is that you just have to do things for longer. Could you make an argument, say, if you hadn't done that, maybe you wouldn't have stumbled upon some of the new ideas that you've, you know, the things that you're working on now, you know? Yeah, for um, sure. It, and who knows what would have happened. Okay, so I want to go into more details about what you're doing now. Could you tell us a bit more about Fame? Yeah, so Fame is it, it's just like a marketing agency where we do one thing for clients. Uh, that thing is we all set up, grow B two B podcast. Fame started because actually I in two thousand nineteen had a job where I worked for a company that I had invested in. This is titled head of demand generation. The best thing that we did, or I did during that year, and I'm not I'm really bad at being employed, so it wasn't I wasn't amazing. But the best thing we did was we saw that one of the personas that the company was targeting is the the persona is called sales operations, like someone who manages the sales team. One of these personas, it's like an emerging role, wasn't really any like media properties for this. Persona. So we were like, okay, the sales operations podcast, and it's called Sales Off Demystified. I'm still actually the host. So uh, we built a podcast. It was great. Some of the guests of the podcast came and bought their software. And so it's an extremely profitable podcast for them. When I was thinking about what to do after leaving or as I was leaving, I was like, well, this process work is working really well. So then we just went and sold that process to other companies. And so fame is the result of that. So our first and our best client are that, that company called Ebster. Mm. And so now we just have a team where we run this process for if nine B2B businesses now where we'll start and grow the podcast. Could you tell the audience why podcasts are more relevant than ever before and why it seems to be the fastest growing medium? I don't think I'm that smart. And so I, I don't think I can answer that question. But the reason why I started investing in this space and the reason mm. why I am bullish like you uh, in the medium is because you just see the most intelligent strategic thinkers in the world. These are the people, the strategy guys at Amazon, Google, Facebook, um, and Spotify are investing in audio. Mm. And so I started seeing that during 2019, as we started growing this podcast for the for the, my employer. And so if these guys are doing it, then clearly, and they're all doing it, clearly something is put like he's driving this do do i know what that is i don't really i i'm, I'm not sure the reasons why audio is going to be massive maybe you do though can did you have the answer i mean so you're speaking to people you know via vcast talking about what they're doing and do you find that beyond just you know helping companies have these conversations you're also learning things from them and i think perhaps that's why you know we are we love it because something, you know, I can listen to a podcast while I'm cleaning or cooking and I can, it's sort of a multitasky um, sort of activity to do that feels um, not as labor intensive as like going to a talk or um, going to a program or just taking a course. And I think part of that is, you know, what the appeal, appeal is for people. Have you found sort of, you know, you're, you're also learning while, you know, creating these podcasts? Yeah, I, I think you're totally right. But with any like movement or trend, there's like multiple things that they're actually driving it. I think one is that the companies are investing in space. I think two is that there is this like bigger drive towards self-help, which is a, a chunk of podcasts for people trying to improve or learn. There's also the hardware that's being produced for to enable this, like the AirPods, like Alexa. So mm. yeah, like I, I think all of those factors are driving the growth. You know what, Tom? Uh, I was actually having uh, dinner with a friend of mine who works for The Independent. Socially distance, of course, before the haters get to me. She was saying that they are looking at investing a lot into podcasts for the next few quarters. Independently from that, I had a chat with someone who works at Google, who's like a mentor of mine. And he was saying, hey, look, start looking at audio more and I was like, you know, why do you say that? He's like, look, Google's making a huge bet on audio products for the next five years. So this is the space to be in. I was actually, you know, like I looked through my Instagram feed and, you know, you're quite prolific on posting and very, posting very transparent and very open content. And my interest was peaked because I was like, okay, invest in audio 
And then I was like, okay, Tom Hunt, he's what's he up to these days? What new business has he started in the next in the last two weeks or whatever that yeah. means? So this kind of all clicked. And I was like, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on here is just because I wanted to find out what your view on this was. So yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of major, you know, Alexa, Google Home, Facebook. I can't remember what the device is called, but you know, every everything seems to be kind of geared towards the audio experience. I think what the point you brought up is quite interesting, Tom, in terms of how, you know, beyond just the podcast we forget that from what people from what consumers invest in podcasts people are like okay we can then create product around it and it's that link between you know the stories that are being told which can be you know brand and um, marketing and what how the reception to that can then help create further product which creates further mm-hmm. jobs which i think is a part of marketing we don't really talk about that connectivity of if you amplify something and it creates you know site for a gap in the market that can then be filled and that also drives economy and i think we don't talk about marketing often from that sense of how it actually can mm-hmm. um, contributes to you know filling gaps in the market or showcasing gaps in the market because of consumer response to what's going on out there yeah completely the other question i wanted to cover this is more kind of your relationship with business and metrics in a way and you know before you mentioned what you your view on how you see see businesses you've obviously set up and closed number of businesses what were the metrics that you relied on you know like yes of course the financial metrics i guess as well as customer transact you know traction were there any other things that you'd look for uh, like clues that would give you an idea if something is along the right path yeah i think i was split it into probably fit into three parts so Uh, external information, both qualitative and quantitative. So Mm. an example of external quantitative would be revenue Mm. or like user signups. Uh, External qualitative would be if, for example, you're talking to the independent or Google and them telling you they're investing. And then, but then the third, I think is potentially the reason that I maybe place too much importance on is internal, like how you feel about the thing. Do you think it is really, what do you enjoy? And do you think that you are good at it? And it is the best place for you to spend your time. And I think one of the reasons why I shut things down prematurely was because I wasn't in the right mental state. I would get too obsessed with it. I'd work every day for six months and then I wasn't uh, like, That would result in me not enjoying it, obviously, because you can't enjoy doing something every day for six months. And then I would take that internal feeling and then be like, I shouldn't be doing this because I don't like doing it. The solution there is to take more time, take some time off and be more balanced, Mm. which is something that I'm also working on. So those are the three things. So external uh, numbers, external opinions, and then how you feel inside. I mean, does that come from your days as working for the management consulting companies in terms of, I guess, you'd go out to businesses and advise them on things that you've just mentioned? So actually, in my role in the consulting companies, it was never that strategic. When mm. you go in at the bottom, you're like an organ, a PM, or at least I was, <laughs> maybe mm. other people aren't, uh, but I, you're like the project manager or you're like the admin yeah. person. You mentioned in your bio, you know, you worked for the city and you got bored really quickly. What was the reaction when you first thought, you know what, this just isn't for me? How did you come to that conclusion? And what was the reaction of your friends and family when you decided, you know what, I'm going to quit my safe corporate role? Yeah, I, it never felt right. Like I remember getting on the train from Clapham to go to London Bridge to the EY Ernst & Young office like the, in, during the first week. And I, I just never felt right like wearing those clothes and getting on the train at that time. So there was always something that was like lingering. And so my solution, I didn't really say anything to anybody, but my solution was I'll go to a different one and I'll get paid more. And so I moved from Ernst & Young to Accenture. And that was good for a little bit, but then obviously it was the same feeling. So it, it just never felt right. And, and then I guess, I, I think people kind of knew, like you, it's very hard to show or hard to fake, or I find it hard to fake. So my kind of family and friends were, were like, okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. My parents were very happy that I got the job initially. I actually can't remember their reaction when I said, I'm leaving and I'm moving out of my flat and I'm going flying, where did I fly first? It might be Venezuela. Well, like I'm going yeah. I know it was to Europe. It was to like Prague or something. Yeah, I actually can't remember what their um, what their reaction was, but uh, maybe I'll ask them at Christmas well, how they felt. Actually, that that was one of the other questions I had in mind in terms of you traveled the world. I guess you were working from your laptop wherever you had ended up. Did you feel like you were living the dream, or what? What does that actually feel like as a yeah? No, not really, because I get very obsessive about things. So all I was doing was working. I wasn't like celebrating or having fun, really. I was just working. It was cool, like going to new places and taking like a little bit of time off and just living from the suitcase was really good. Yeah, it wasn't the dream. Yeah, it goes back to the balance thing. And maybe if I would have liked it more, I would have been more consistent about what I'm doing. And so now, yes, I'll, I'll probably work like a normal amount, but then I'll, I try to have interests out of work, <laughs> which is going quite well. Like I play chess now okay, and I played football last week. So no, I didn't feel like it was the, the dream. If you could give your 
younger self some advice in terms of work-life balance what would you advise him yeah my, my argument against balance used to be that I'd, you, you, if you're balanced you're going to be average you're not going to achieve the goals mm. I, i'm coming around to the argument that actually you can almost go farther if you are balanced mm. you don't have to work so much you can do better work in short amounts of time if you enjoy your life mm. <laughs> So that my, my advice, and so this is my dad, my dad, yeah. So this was my dad's advice. I'd always used to get injured because I would take up a new thing. Or I was really just running and I would just run too much and I'd get injured. But I'd start going to the gym and then I'd get injured. And my dad always used to say that hey, like everything is about balance. And I, I just ignored that for a decade. And then now I'm like, God, dad, you are so right about that. So the, uh, the advice I would give to my 21 year old self so how in a typical week i mean i guess you are the host of your podcast bcast and also you're running fame which you are bootstrapping at the moment what does your typical week look like i do just to clarify bcast the fame is the agency bcast is a podcast hosting software oh, so I see. It's, a, it's a tool that people can host the software that their, their podcast on well i do have another podcast as well though of course because I, I have to have more than two things going at the same time <laughs> um so how, what is the normal day only recently started getting out quite early like six and I'll run for 15 minutes and then I'll have a shower and then I'll meditate and then I will write the to-do list um, in the thing and then I'll start working normally about 6.45. Now, because mm. I know that at nine, I have the team, I have the clients pinging me. So I, I, I don't get that much good work done in the day, but I'll have a two-hour window where I try not to look at Slack or email where I actually like get good stuff done in, in normally writing, writing or thinking. And so I'll do that and I'll get to nine and I'll just have black coffee. After nine, everything starts happening. Maybe I'll get a little bit of good work done during the day. I like to push all podcast recording and try to push meetings if possible to the afternoon so in the morning you might get like a little bit of good work done but normally it's just the two hours before and it happens that things actually happen that i can actually move stuff forward i see mm. the rest of the day more of like maintenance making sure everything happens that's supposed to happen the two hours in the morning like pushing basically pushing the rocks up the hill which is what you're doing when you're growing any any business how that split between fame and bcast it's about 50 50 in terms of pushing there are quite a bit of overlap if you think about what we're trying to do for the customers of eat both of those is grow their b2 business with a podcast so there are overlaps with how, like the things I do to push them forward. But yeah, that's how that's how the day looks at the moment. How do you split your time between, I mean, do you just like prescribe yourself like a, a set number of hours, like a 40 hour week? And then, you know, now that you realize that you need a healthy kind of balance, or do you actually tend to be very task oriented? Say, okay, these are the things I need to get done. Once I do that, I'll go and, you know, have a walk or go for a run or, or swim or play chess. I basically try and finish work at five, but maybe it shouldn't be like, maybe it should just be once, once I've done these things. There's always more things that can be done. But the point is it's bad if you do more things because then you're going to hate your life and you're going to get burnt out. I try to finish at five. And so six till five is that's 11 hours. And I do, I don't really stop for lunch, but I, like I'm not doing good work at all for 11 hours. I'm doing good work for like three hours. Mm. So maybe I could cut that down and finish at four and then have more time to like do fun stuff and, it, mm. and enjoy my life. So that's a good, that's a good point. I don't have a good answer to that question. For my side, yeah, I've started meditating in the mornings as well. This was, uh, you know, directly as a result of the lockdown where I needed a change of scene, which I couldn't really have outside of my flat or just going around the block. And I started looking, I spoke to a friend of mine, Colin, and he gave me, you know, he's been meditating for years and he's just like, look, just try it, you know, close your eyes and just think about nothing. I, it's, that's incredibly hard to do. <laughs> I started by doing it for two minutes at a time and then it increased to three to four. And now, you know, sometimes I get up to five to 10 minutes. Uh, and I'm trying to get myself a minute every day so I can meditate for longer. And then, you know, I, I start getting on with my day. Um, and Nikki, do you have anything to say about it? I know that we're just talking here. <laughs> Yeah, I did have a question. So in terms of doing the hard stop at five, I think that's quite a challenging one, particularly because we're working from like our home spaces now and you're sort of like, you don't have to move as much. How did you get yourself to the point of saying, okay, it's this time and I'm going to make this cut off and you know yeah how did you get yourself to that point a good really good question May, like scheduling things in the evening helps like if you have to go and play football or meet a friend at six to go for a run then you have to do that so yeah I, I don't have a good answer it's more like you just have to do it but planning stuff and social pressure can help but you seem quite like a person who says um go until stop in terms of like you know you if you look at something a project life you're like I want to do this and you can go for it I know you've spoken about sort of you know regretting stop you know selling off some companies or not following through the idea but have you ever thought of yourself as just a starter who's meant to pass the baton because you seem to work as a person who you know can build something but you don't have the steam to finish when your heart's not in it so have you ever considered that maybe I'm just you know no, the this is a... in the race 
This is a very good point, Nikki. Well done. Yeah, I think some people are better at founding companies than being a CEO and running them. I do get really good at founding companies, and I think I am really good at that stage. And so I don't see there's two options. Either I just do that, and then maybe I work in a like accelerator where I help companies found help other companies get started, or I just build stuff and then pass them on. So that's one option where I only do that. Or the other option is that I try to challenge myself and keep doing something. And that's the option that I'm taking because I do think that I can. Well, the, the, we're going to find out, right? I've been doing these two things for a year. Yeah, so, so I was like, okay, we're almost at the 18, mu- 18 months yeah, mark. Yeah, I know. But we're also going to be working differently. So the options for, you know, how you can network to sell or push are different. So I wonder if this is your, you know, 2020 has been good for your type of work. Um, yeah, it's very, very well spotted. I right now at the 12 month point, I admit we're not at the 18 month point, but I'm feeling confident that I can do these two things for the next three to five years. So we'll see if I'm going to do that or not. Maybe I should come on in a year and, and you can, well, actually you check my LinkedIn to see if I'm doing two other yeah, things. We'll or, do that. And if I am, then there should be a punishment. Um, and if I'm not, then there should be a prize. <laughs> we'll all go for a meal in at Nando's. Yeah, 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 yeah sounds good. <laughs> on Tom. Uh, and, but if you do can manage it, then I'll get the meal. Um, sounds good. You can have everything you want. <laughs> do you think your space, the changing of space has like sort of contributed to how you're working differently? And in like in a positive or a negative or neutral way, do you think that's just really changed how you approach your work? And so your so the, the the work environment, like the office yeah. or the room, I think it does have it does play a part. I think having one place in, in your house that you like made really good to work is really important. We didn't. We were traveling. We we left London and we're basically safe hopping for six months. And it's really hard to do to get a routine and to do good work when you're doing that. I'm trying to think about this where I either have or haven't enjoyed the work. And I think especially traveling around the world is similar to this year where you never really have a good work environment. It can be quite uncomfortable. There's so much uncertainty outside of work that maybe that did contribute to not enjoying the work so much. So I know that for the next year at least where I'll be in this work environment, maybe for longer. And so this is another thing for us to look at and test i think it's probably bullish for my for my sticking power so we're coming up to a year of you know um fame and be cast and i think for a lot of people there were ideas you had in january and there were ideas you had to have by april because everything you sort of planned for how you're going to engage or talk to people had to be different because of where people were and also the concerns people had what were the ideas you had in january and how have they changed now or have they at all um for the businesses that you run so both fame and be cast the general thesis of the two companies hasn't changed since they were uh, conceived which is actually so one of them was conceived really 18 months ago one one of them actually they were both kind of conceived 18 months ago in august 2019 the thesis hasn't changed maybe like it's like nuances in the marketing strategy or the product has, has obviously changed like we're still just doing the, the goals are exactly the same we're still trying to do exactly the same things and we're just getting slightly better every month or i like to think we are getting slightly better every month both in the marketing and and on the product side and that is really this is really how you grow a good business unless you have some super innovative idea and you have the ability to execute on that idea and you raise loads of money there's not going to be this big step change in the value that you can create for people uh, that will drive massive growth Uh, in reality it's very incremental and so that's what we are doing or have been doing since january and that i think is the secret which is something that I didn't really realize before. I used to think that you would spend some time building something, you put it in the market, you get massive growth and you sell. Because that's what you read about on TechCrunch. Whereas actually, I think, especially with bootstrapped, not super innovative businesses like we have, it's just small uh, incremental improvements. Interesting. I want to go back into what you were saying a bit earlier. And I think this is a TED talk that I had watched a few, can't remember when it was, this whole year's a blur. It just basically said, human beings, the, the mind is set up so you are at your best at certain points during the day and you mentioned you know you're you're really really concentrated and good for three hours a day maximum or whatever that may be for you is this also when you come up with your best ideas because the number of companies you've set up and ideas you've had is probably more than anyone has in their lifetime how did you come up with these ideas and do you still have ideas for other businesses that you may want to do in the back of your mind I think that the, the, the golden hours for me, as I said, like seven till nine in the morning, I think those, those hours could be good for ideas. I think those hours are best use or better use for execution. Ideas can actually, they, they don't have to be done in the golden hours. They can be done at other times. I, I, I actually get really good ideas in the sauna. If I'm on my own in the sauna and I've mm. just 
an exercise, then I get really good ideas. I think I, ideas, you don't have to be in this prime state to get the good ideas. In the bath as well, I get good ideas. How to, how to have good ideas? I think the secret is reading. Ooh. I've been like an avid, not an avid, it, it, it's actually on and off, but I, I've read a lot since 2012, 13, really about like business marketing and self-help. I think the uh, ideas or I think a, or creativity, or well, a good definition I have of cre- creativity in my head is just connection between different things. Mm. And for you to connect different things, you have to have things to connect from. And you build up that kind of knowledge, I guess, through reading. And then if you have that, you can, it's natural to make connections from them. The business ideas, I think, yeah, I think it's probably just like reading. I've got those ideas from, I guess, podcasts help as well. It's like consuming good information, which can come really from reading and also listening. I mean, to quote your TEDx talk, you mentioned connecting the dots from what you've done before is going to eventually lead you to finding your path in the future. How has those random things that you've done, travels that you've had, books that you've read, contributed to you going forward it's a good question we have to credit steve jobs for this of course yes it was steve jobs Um, (laughs) yeah i think like if you if you think about what i'm doing now with both businesses it's one is we do content marketing for businesses in the form of the podcast and the other is we enable people to do content marketing for their own business in the form of the hosting software i think that if you look at my past work history everything that i've been good at really has been been marketing uh, and it's, e- e- even drilling down it's been content marketing which is just basically creating information that might help sell your thing i think that that experience has really helped with what i'm doing now because i really have if I started in 2013, seven years of marketing experience. And so I am able to advise and I do know about stuff in the marketing area. That's probably the kind of number one thing. I, I mean, I have built a small agency before, have built a small SaaS product before. So that also helps, I guess, with what we're mm. doing now. Another thing, you know, what are some of the best or the most inspirational books that you've read? The one that comes to mind first is the book that kind of drove me to check transition from the agency to that online marketplace was the millionaire fast lane by mj demarco sounds really scammy but it's really it's a really good model for thinking about how to build a business or what business is so that probably still is one of my favorites apart from that i think the most fundamental or the book that's most fundamentally influenced how i think is the selfish gene by richard dawkins it's a really once you you can't unread that book it basically explains to you how everything happened for us to get here and once you know that you can i think you can use that to inform your decisions or understand when you are thinking in non-productive ways so those two are very different books but uh have both massively influenced my journey what are you reading at the moment i'm quite interested in finance and, and money at the moment so i bought a book not last night, but the night before, called The Death of Money, which is a really long, boring book about how the Deutschmark, no, the Mark, the German Mark, uh, hyperinflated in the Weimar Republic in the 1920s. So that um, <laughs> that's what I'm reading at the moment. I don't know if I'm going to finish that one because it is quite dry. Sorry to the author if he's listening, but he probably isn't. So, so that's what I'm reading at the moment. If we go back a, a few books to try and pick out a marketing-related one, I think it's been a while since I read a marketing book. But no, the, the, I, I read a good one on podcasts there are, there isn't many good books on podcasts but the one that i have read that i did think was really good i'm trying to get him on my show is called build a big podcast but i think it's david taylor and that was actually really good so that that's one i'd recommend if people are interested in podcasts going away from just marketing and business books you know like are there any other uh, fiction books that have really kind of changed the way you see the world my favorite fiction book is shantaram big uh, read. Have, you, have you have you read that i haven't read it but it's on my kind of long list of books to read and yeah so good yeah you should bump that up it, it made me really want to go to india and so i went to india because of that book it's just wow. a really great story a true story supposedly about a guy who leaves he's like a he leaves prison in australia goes to india and does loads of crazy stuff so that that's a really amazing book um that's my favorite fiction i don't know if it's influenced me I just had this brain wave. Could you say that has some analogies with your life, you know, being in prison in a corporate role, doing a lot oh, of crazy stuff nice. and finding yourself? Yeah, I, 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 I've never thought about that, but <laughs> I, I read it. When did I read it? I think I read it before going in the corporate world. Seeds. And so, yeah, I mean, it's that's a, that's a lovely parallel you just drawn there, Sud. So maybe that's why it connects so much. It's like, you know, Buddha, you know, he lived in a palace. He wanted to see reality for himself. So... One day he snuck out and, you know, he never came back. A bit like all the people in management consulting, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. I think um, just to sort of wrap things up, what's been the best lesson that you've learned running your businesses? 
the most fundamental thing you have to understand if you're going to do well in business is the ability to put someone else's need before your own. So if you do that in the short term, in the long term, you, you can ultimately win. That's something, or like basically mean giving someone the better deal, because if you do that enough times for a period of time, then ultimately you'll probably win. That is something that I, I don't think I really got in the early days. Maybe that only clicked like halfway through the business career. Uh, because it used to be that previously I would not give someone the end of the better deal, which is much more short-term thinking. And so that's like a big lesson that anyone should take time to try and understand because once you get that you can speed up stuff because you're just happy to really help other people as much as you can because you know that ultimately if you stay in the game long enough that it's, it will come back to you so i think that's probably the the most fundamental one that that has clicked in the last few years well that's a mic drop moment <laughs> put that sign effect on how can people find you and how can people get in touch with you yeah so if you search tom hunt on linkedin or twitter or Facebook, you'll probably find me. And uh, you, or my email address is tom at tomhunt.io. Cool, so cool, if you cool. have any questions, you can just email me. But yeah, or li LinkedIn is probably the best place. You've been pretty prolific on LinkedIn in terms of being super transparent and really writing your, your journey from what you're doing at the moment. What kind of reactions have you been receiving from people who follow you, uh, people who write to you, maybe even people who DM you directly? Yeah, I think I, it's always been within me to share. I think it's because... Two reasons. One, I like attention. Two, I've learned a shed load when other people share share stuff. If only really in the last month or so that I've been posting on LinkedIn every day with stuff like that. Mm. I don't know if I've had any like really good things happen. Maybe you have to do it for longer. Mm. But the, the, the best one I can remember, though, when I was growing Virtual Valley, which is an online marketplace that we've discussed, I did a podcast where every day I'd do a 10-minute episode and I'd talk about how it was growing. There's this guy that listened. I didn't actually know he listened. He like emailed me afterwards when I was thinking about raising money for the next thing. And he was like, I listened to your podcast for Virtual Valley for X amount of time. I think it was really great. I can invest in this thing for you. It never actually happened in the end. But that's, that's a good example, I think, of sharing, like being honest and open. Can It can really draw, like a, a load of people will push away because they think you're an idiot or you, you, they think you're doing stuff wrong. But then there'll be a, a probably a smaller group of people that will be attracted to that. And so, and when they are, there's quite a strong attraction. Um, mm. For example, someone just wanted to give me money even though we never met he just listened to me on a podcast so mm. i think that's the uh that's probably the, the best end result is that you attract a specific type of person probably one that believes and thinks in the same way as you and then those bonds can be be profitable um right. as that what would have been if it happened in terms of you know what you've been listening to this year in the podcasting space or what's been created is there anything that's really stood out for you that you think everyone needs to try this once to see if it's studio taste yeah, the one I was actually listening to before, just for this interview, it, uh, it's called All In, and it's with four like Silicon Valley titans. So one is the guy Jason who does this week in startups with Chamath, who uh, they're basically four billionaires, and they're just chatting because they used to play poker together, and now they just record it basically. Uh, I think it's doing really well because it has these massive names, so have massive volumes on Twitter. But that's really, really good because they're all just so intelligent. Aside from that, I do like my first million, which is a podcast released by The Hustle, where they are very open about stuff they're doing and business ideas. I actually don't have many marketing ones in there. I guess the the top by Nathan Latke is like a classic. There's a lot to learn from him. And I think he's a really good podcaster. So those well, are probably the three. I've heard so many good things about that podcast. I'm going to check it out. And I think from our side, you know, we please keep on posting on LinkedIn because I the reason I wanted to get in touch with you was because I read a couple of things. I'd say I did a, I did a screenshot of one of your posts and I was like, hey, why don't we just actually get in touch with him? So that's how it all came about. Thank you so much for taking the time out and talking to us today, Tom. We look forward to having that meal at Nando's with you in about a year's time. Yeah. Who's going to be paying? Thank you so much. And it's good that someone's reading the LinkedIn post. And that's actually a good example of attracting cool people to you. So um, thank you so much, guys. That was really probably not like any other podcast interview I've done, but in a good way. So thank you so much, guys, <laughs> no, for having me on. You know, you're usually on the other side, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So I do know what it's like to be on the other side. And you guys have done a fantastic job. Basically broken down my uh, psychological uh, <laughs> and my psyche. Like like a self, like an analysis of Tom more than actually talking about marketing. Yeah, I, I should be paying you guys for the therapy session. <laughs> oh, you can pay it in Nando's vouchers. <laughs> Thank you again, Tom, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and don't forget to listen to other episodes of Zero Calorie Marketing Podcast. If you have a minute, do leave us a review on whichever platform you happen to be enjoying this episode. We'd love to hear from our listeners, so drop us a message with guest suggestions, thoughts on the episodes, and even compliments at zcm at interestingcontent.co.uk. 